here today. It's been a while since I've done this, so bear with me. Uh, I'm going to do a story on uh, the right decision, and it teaches a lesson at the end. And uh, it says, it was the beginning of vacation when Mr. Davis, a friend of my father, came to see us and asked me, asked to let me go home with him. I was much pleased with the thought of going out of town. The journey was delightful. When we reached Mr. David's house, everything looked as if I were going to have a fine time. Fred Davis, a boy about my own age, took me cordially by the hand, and all the family soon seemed like old friends. At last, Mr. Davis said, it's almost bedtime. Then I expected family prayer, but we were very soon directed to our chambers. How strange it was to me, for I had never before been in a household without a family altar. Come, said Fred, mother says you and I are going to be bedfellows. And I followed him up two pair of stairs to a nice little chamber which he called his room. He undressed first and jumped into bed. I was much longer about it, for a new set of thoughts began to rise in my mind. When my mother put my portmanteau in my hand just before the coach started, she said tenderly in a low tone, remember, Robert, you are a Christian boy. I knew very well what that meant. I had now just come to a point of time where her words were to be minded. At home, I was taught the duties of a Christian child. Abroad, I must not neglect them. And one of, one of these was evening prayer. From a very little boy, I had been in the habit of kneeling and asking for forgiveness of God for Jesus' sake, acknowledging his mercies and seeking his protection and blessing. Why don't you come to bed, Robert, cried Fred. What are you sitting there for? I was afraid to pray and afraid not to pray. It seemed as I could not kneel down and pray before Fred. What would he say? Would he not laugh? laugh? The fear of Fred made me a coward, yet I could not lie down on a prayerless bed. If I needed the protection of my heavenly Father at home, how much more abroad. I wish many wishes that I had slept alone, that Fred would go to sleep or something else. I hardly knew what, but Fred would not go to sleep. Perhaps struggles like these take place in the bosom of everyone where, when he leaves home and begins to act for himself. And on this decision, my, on, on this decision may depend his character for time and for eternity. With me, the struggle was severe. At last, to Fred's cry, come boy, come to bed. I mustered the courage to say, I will need to kneel down and pray first. That is always my custom. Pray, said Fred, turning himself over on his pillow and saying no more. His propriety of conduct made me ashamed. Here I had long been afraid of him, and yet he knew my wishes. He was quiet and left me to myself. How thankful I was that duty and conscience triumphed. That settled my future course. It gave me strength for time to come. I believe that the decision of the Christian boy, by God's blessing, made me a Christian man. For in the next, <coughs> for in after years, I was thrown amid trials and temptations, which 
must have drawn me away from God and from virtue had it not been for my settled habit of secret prayer. Let every boy who has pious parents read and think about this. You have been trained in Christian duties and principles. When you go from home, do not leave them behind you. Carry them with you and stand by them. And then in weak temptation, by God's help, they will stand by you. <coughs> Take a manly stand on the side of your God and Savior, of your Father's God. It is by abandoning these their Christian birthrights that so many boys go astray and grow up to be young men dishonoring parents without hope and without God in the world. So what did that what did that story tell you? Do you change anything when you're away from home? Do you keep your prayers up and all the things that you were taught at home? That's very important. And I'm glad to see you guys are nodding your head. That's wonderful. But uh, that's the end of my story. Do you have any questions? Okay. I think we go on from here. <laughs> So this morning I have a song I'm going to do. It's a special music. It's uh, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And uh, you think about Revelation chapter 5, I believe it is, where there was John was weeping in heaven because here's this scroll of the plan of salvation <clears throat> that is sealed up. <clears throat> Nobody can open it up. Nobody's worthy in heaven or under the heavens or under the earth. So they're crying, John's crying, because nobody can help open the scroll and put into play the provisions of the plan of salvation. But then they say, hey, wait, there is one who's worthy. It's the line of the tribe of Judah. It's the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And so all through the history from when the first promise was given to Adam and Eve that Jesus would be coming down the line, there was this heartfelt cry, O come, O come, Emmanuel.
So it just happens to be <clears throat> that music kind of moves my heart. And that song definitely moves my heart. I don't know, I've been reading through the first six chapters of the um, Desire of Ages lately, <clears throat> which is all about the advent of Christ, which is a powerful book that goes right along with Scripture. It's so amazing. But uh, as I've been doing that, I just remember reading the part where that when Jesus came, it was among the darkest time in Earth's history. Darkest time. Slavery abounded in the Roman Empire, lots of slaves, lots of hardships under the Roman Empire. It was, it was a very difficult time. And that's the time when Jesus came. So the prayer, O come, O come, Emmanuel, was on the lips of every person in Israel for sure. And I like the way the song ends because it kind of goes on high and it goes down to the condescension of Christ. From the throne of glory, laying aside the crown, taking off the royal robes, stepping down into a single cell, and planted in Mary's womb to grow to become like us and go through life's experience like us. And I'm just thankful that he was willing to do that. So let's have a word of prayer and jump right in today. <clears throat> Father God, we're thankful that we can worship in your house today. We're thankful that you took the risk to come to save us, and uh, Lord, we're thankful that you were victorious. But now we ask you, Holy Spirit, to be with us as we study today in Jesus' name. Amen. So my title this morning is called The Sack of Christmas. Uh, Thursday night I was sitting on a Zoom phone call, and um, it was Adventist Medical Evangelism Network. They were kind of doing a wrap-up on the conference that we just had out at uh, Southern California in October. Um, and so we were looking through, we had keynote speakers coming in. Our theme was uh, the, in His presence, living our life day by day, moment by moment in the presence of God. And how does that work? That and how do we live that out? It was a great, <clears throat> great uh, weekend of conferencing. So we were looking at the scores because everybody could rate <clears throat> the, on the one through five what they felt each presentation gave, both of the speaker as well as the breakout seminars and presentations. And <clears throat> overall, it looked like wow, a big success, right? We have higher scores than we've ever had before in the 20, 19 years of its existence. 3ABN was picking it up. I don't know if you guys watched 3ABN, but I think they were just recently broadcasting the conference uh, on 3ABN, so you might have seen it. Um, and you can pick it up on Audioverse as well. They also have the great presentations that were done there, so you can pick up those. So it seemed like everything was a success. But then, as we talked about it, we talked about factors that surprised us. I'll call them X factors, factors behind the scenes, which if they weren't in place, we would not have had a successful conference. There was a program director who was the coordinator of everything. She actually spent so much time that she oversaw the catering and made sure the hotels, or the chain that we had rented and hired to do this, he had the right food out at the right time for the right number of people. And in the eight meals that we ate over the three and a half days that we were there, she had a chance to sit down for one time for 10 minutes to eat. The rest of the time, she was busy making sure, hey, they need more food over here, uh, you know, it's, we got to get this out now. Uh, we got more guests than we planned. Can you guys make some more food? Because on Sabbath, we, uh, we invite the students to Loma Linda Dental School and also all the like medical school to come. And we had more than we planned for this year, which is a good thing. But then that put a strain on the food. And so the cooks had to cook extra. So there was the X factor, the program director, hiding under the radar. We wouldn't have known it unless she told us. She said, I worked so hard. Even on Sabbath, I didn't even feel like I was keeping the Sabbath holy. Here we are trying to provide an environment for people to come and worship God and connect, and then our own people were working hard. Three Avian crew was working so hard no time to produce this and to be able to broadcast it. So we're trying to think, next year we've got to get this thing down so all the people who come, including those who are putting it on, can enjoy the Sabbath. We've got to have more volunteers, more helpers, or organization. And then there was the other thing. There was a planning committee chair, vice chair, Josie. She was out there talking to the people, making sure, okay, you need to be here at this time. We've got to do microphone checks on you and, you know, just all behind the scenes stuff that was going on. And we realized the big takeaway was, you know what? We've got to do better in um, helping the people behind the scenes because they've been carrying a way too heavy load. It wasn't a blessing for them. It was a blessing for everybody else. But without them, this program would have flopped in a big way. When I think about uh, the plan of salvation, there is a key player. Jesus Christ is the key player. There's no question about it. 
But it's kind of fascinating how the Godhead is. If you go to John chapter 14, verse 9 real quick, it seems like none of the Godhead want to take the credit, or they don't want to be in the limelight. They don't, they're not turning the limelight on themselves. They're always turning it on one or the other of the Godhead. And I think, you know, that's for us to learn, too, that we shouldn't seek, we shouldn't be center-seeking, look at me, look at me. You know, I know sometimes in our culture, we're really big about that. We're number one, you know. But we're number one. Look at us, how great we are. But look at this in John chapter 14, verse 9. Jesus, who is rightfully God, who rightfully deserves our adoration and worship. There's no question. And we'll look at that a little bit this morning. But John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus said to him, talking to Philip, he says, Have I been with you so long, Philip, yet you have not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. So Jesus isn't saying, hey, look at me, Philip. No, he says, you know, Philip, I've been talking to you about the Father. Everything I do, the, the miracles that I do, the teachings that I do come from the Father through me to you. So Jesus is like, yeah, he is the key player in my mind, but it's kind of hard because so is the Father the key player, and so is the Holy Spirit the key player. All of them are, but so much like is the rule of heaven, the law of heaven, this otherness, never central focus on me. It's not about me. Satan was all about that. If I, He wants to exalt himself above the throne of God. He wanted to be worshipped on the sides of the north. It was all about him, but God's not that way. God is not that way. It's all about others, otherness, serving others selflessly, you know, just benevolence. So when we look at chapter 14, verse 26, we see now the Holy Spirit comes into play. So what about the Holy Spirit? It says, but the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So here comes the Holy Spirit. He's sent from the Father, and he's not even sent in his own name. He's sent in Jesus' name, right? So here he's going to be doing some work. He's not going to get the credit for it. He's not going to get the credit. He's going to be the X factor. He's going to be flying below the radar of detectability, Jesus is going to be the out front person, the visible person, but behind him, he's really speaking God's words, doing God's works, and working through him as the Holy Spirit behind the scenes that nobody sees. But the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. That's the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit's not initiating some new teaching or some new thoughts or stuff like that. No, he's reminding us of the words of Jesus. And he's bringing it home. Here's the words of Jesus. Here's how it applies to your life. Here's how it can be lived out. And through my power and strength, it can happen. But the focus is on Jesus. So the Holy Spirit will remind us of the words of Jesus. And Jesus will, his works will reveal the Father. Otherness, X factors. There's Jesus. This is the first Advent season. Our focus is on Jesus. He was incarnate. He was born in our family. He's one of us. But those X factors without the Father, without the Holy Spirit, it would be a no effect. Jesus coming down here, it would, it would be nothing. All three of them working together. So when we think of Christmas, we know it would not be possible without the Father's love. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. God sent Jesus to be our savior. Thankful for God, his big role that he plays there, giving permission for Jesus to go and take the terrible risk that he took. God was definitely a factor there. Two, Christmas would not happen if Jesus chose not to come. He could have chosen not to. Put yourself in his position. You're sitting on the throne of the universe. You got the triple crown on you. You got the royal robes. You got the angel choirs singing to you. They love to be in your presence. God is such a loving God. God is love. John says that twice. God is love. He's not doesn't have love. He does have love, but he is also is love. That's who he is. His character is. So we think about that Jesus was willing to lay it all aside, to come and live in poverty. I was reading through Desire of Ages that Satan, every opportunity, it just vexed him that there was one human being who had not sinned. He could not get Jesus to sin in any way, shape, form, or manner. He was vexed by that. He was angry about that. He tried everything he could do to get Jesus to sin, to get him off the path for our salvation. He tried everything. You know how Satan is with you. Can you imagine that you're not going to be the savior of the world? 
but Jesus was going to be, I'll tell you, if I was Satan, I would put all my energies into making Jesus fail. I would put all my energies, and I'm sure Satan did that because the very existence of Satan beyond is dependent upon his success in causing Jesus to sin. If Jesus is successful, there's the plan of salvation. We escape Satan's tears. We will not live, die the eternal death. Satan will ultimately be destroyed. Evil will be destroyed. Evil angels, demons, and all that. There'll be a new heaven, a new earth. Satan will lose. Everything's dependent upon, can he break Jesus down? Believe me, he tried. So Jesus lived a terrible life of temptation all the way from the birth to the grave. Jesus was vexed by Satan trying every which way to make him trip up and fall. But Jesus knew that coming in, and he consented to that. Interesting, if you read the Zarya of Ages, that when God explained the plan of salvation to the angels, they said, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Don't subject yourself to all the shame and humiliation, to all the battering. They Jesus knew the end from the beginning. He was sharing with them exactly what the crucifixion was going to be like and all that. And they were like, stop. Let one of us go in your place. Jesus said, no, I got to go. I'm the only one who can represent the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm the only one who can represent God's character rightly. The question about God's character has been thrown open to the universe by Satan's accusations against God. And I'm the only one who can really answer them. <clears throat> So Jesus consented a miracle and a grace that I praise the Lord for. We must not forget that there is a support cast of hundreds of millions of angels in this plan of salvation. Every angel is involved in some way, shape, or form for our salvation. Heaven has spent themselves. The staggering cost, it says that God emptied all heaven in the gift of his Son. When Jesus came to earth, the banking account on heaven was zero. You know, I, I won't recommend this to anybody, but um, my wife and I, once in a while, we're traveling through, we would stop, and uh, when you go through Nevada, of course, there's a lot of gambling, and of course, they have these great buffets, so you can go and get for cheap, you know, good food, and you're passing through, we're not going to go gamble or go to their whatevers, but uh, on the way to get the food, you got to walk through all that stuff, and out, out there, I saw this roulette wheel. And I saw people putting down lots of money on just one or two numbers, and they spin the wheel. And if it lands on that number, man, they hit the jackpot. But if it doesn't land on that number, they lose all their money. When I think about Jesus, it was love that compelled him to come and take the risk. And he put, as it were, his very life on one number on that roulette wheel, as it were. They risked all heaven because if Jesus failed... Everything changes. We're lost, eternally lost. It totally changes everything in heaven. Is, is Jesus fails. If he sins, you can't really go back to heaven either. Satan is victorious. Satan has the right, and sin has the right to exist forever and ever. And heaven took the risk, and Jesus was successful. I'm grateful for that. What does it look like? Jesus, to be successful, he was going to have to live a perfect life of obedience all the way through his life. No mistakes along the way. From the time he's born all the way down to the very end, even going through the cross and all the crucifixion, the pain, the agony, the separation from the Father, the rejection of Judas, the betrayal of Peter, and the disciples all fleeing him, and he was left alone. Jesus tread the wine press alone, it says. Jesus, despite all that, he would have to be sinless. He would have to maintain his fidelity to a loving humanity despite what they did to him. In order for this to be successful, he would have to make an atoning sacrifice and die. He would have to die, be willing and consent to die for us, to pay the penalty for our sin. In order for this to be successful, Jesus is going to have to be resurrected. He's going to send to the Father. He's going to start a whole new ministry, being our advocate before the Father and plead in the merits of his righteousness in place of our filthy rags, that he has the right to blot out our sins and our iniquities and our transgressions and write our name in the, law, in the book of heaven, in the book of salvation. In order for this to be successful, Jesus is going to be, have to be able to provide us the mercy and the grace, come boldly before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. All of these things are going to have to work, and that grace will have to sustain us through until this time of the sealing where we seal our, our determination on accepting or rejecting the grace of God is going to be determined by our choices, and then we're going to be sealed in it, either rejecting it and receive the mark of the beast at the end or 
accepting it and receiving the seal of God. All of these things kick into place if Jesus is successful. Then Jesus will come and give everyone their reward based on their faith in his provisions and their faithfulness to what he's asked them to do. But behind the scenes, behind the scenes is another factor that without it being there, we could not have a Christmas at all. What's the mystery factor? Let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Luke chapter 1 says, verse 28, And having come in, the angel said to her, that the angel Gabriel, Rejoice, highly favored one, talking to Mary. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. What a great greeting, right? God is with you. Well, we know God is with us as well. But Mary, you are blessed among women. (laughs) Why? Because God handpicked Mary to be the mother of the Messiah. Can you imagine that? She lived in poverty. She didn't go to the schools. She didn't have the degree, the pedigree of education and all these things. She wasn't a higher upper in society, but she sure knew God, and she was known in the courts of heaven. You have found favor with God. Blessed are you among women. Verse 30, then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. I'll tell you what, if there's anybody I want to find favor with, I would prefer it to be with God than anybody else. How about you? Right? I'll tell you, you know, lots of people do lots of things to win plaudits and applause of men, but that counts for nothing. What really matters is what does God think about us? Where are we in a relationship with him? Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God, verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. <clears throat> there it is. There it is. For 4,000 years, they've been hearing about the Messiah is going to come, the Messiah is going to come, the Messiah is going to come. And here today on this day, the angel comes and said, Mary, the Messiah is going to come and you're going to be the mother of the Messiah. I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to take a big staggering back and say, well, wait a minute, I am going to be the mother of God? Whoa, what is that? What is that? How can I ever parent good enough to be the mother of the Messiah. Have you ever thought about that when your little child was born? It's like, how am I going to be successful in raising this? I know nothing about being a dad or, wow. I think it would have been a staggering moment for Mary, and I think she was. It's like, what? Okay. <clears throat> so there it is. Mary, Mary is going to have a, whoops, well, how's this going to happen? That's what she says. You know, how's it going to happen? I, I'm true and betrothed to Joseph, but <clears throat> we're not married yet. How's this going to happen? It's a good question, right? How am I going to be pregnant with the Son of God? Verse 34, how can this be since I do not know a man? Luke 135, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also this Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. There it is. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, I would love to have a discussion or sit in a classroom of science and have the Holy Spirit describe, you know. So what I did is I took the DNA of Mary and then I did this and then we got the DNA united so that God could become a man and still retain his divinity while he embraces humanity. How did you do that, Holy Spirit? How does that work? That's beyond me. It's just like... Some things are just out there. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Somehow, I think we're going to just contemplate things like this for eternity, never completely grasp it because there's the mystery of godliness. It's beyond us. But it does stretch our imaginations just a little bit. How, God, did you do that, Holy Spirit? That you did it at all is awesome. We praise you and we thank you for it. So the Holy Spirit would come upon her. The power of the highest would overshadow her. The result would be that Mary would give birth to the Son of God. It intrigues me that right on the heels of this, you know, it's kind of like when God said to um, Gideon, Gideon, I want you to go down and to to take on the Amalekites. uh, I'm sorry, the Midianites. Yeah, that's true. There's a hundred plus thousand of them out there against your little numbers, but I'm going to be with you. So go ahead and take them on. Oh, wait, you're going to need to have your faith strengthened on this undertaking. So why don't you in... 
your servant go down into the valley, and you're going to hear a vision down there. It's going to strengthen your faith and give you the strength you need to do the mission. So he goes down and hears it. Somebody has a dream, you know, here's the barley loaf, rolls in the camp, flips the tips upside down, tents upside down, and it's like, what's the interpretation inside the interpretation? The person who had the dream said, I think it's Gideon. He's going to overthrow us. We're going to be defeated tonight. You know how it is? And now Gideon's like, that's the word of the Lord through the people that we're fighting against. God's given us the victory. Let's go. 300 guys, let's go. We got this by the power of God. So what about Mary? Mary, you're going to give birth to the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is divinity, clothed with humanity. <clears throat> How can this be? Mary, I'm going to tell you about another miracle that's taken place. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 36. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, <clears throat> she also has conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. Oh, wow, wait a minute, Grandma Elizabeth? I mean, here she is. She is postmenopausal. It's past the time of childbearing for her life. And now she who is, she who is barren is now pregnant. What? You've got to be kidding. That's a miracle birth right there we're talking about. But it's interesting. The angel <clears throat> said what the angel said about John the Baptist in utero. <clears throat> Verse 15. <clears throat> For he shall be called great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. I, you know, I just don't know. I don't know of any other child except maybe Jesus who was filled with the Holy Spirit, even from their mother's womb. You know, I, I think we have, as parents, the privilege of praying for our children in utero that God would fill them with the Holy Spirit. I think we have the privilege <clears throat> of, of trying to follow the advice here that the angel gave to uh, Elizabeth, don't drink any wine or strong drink because you're carrying the forerunner of the Messiah, his mission. By the way, if you, if you really look at it, it fascinates me that everybody who's anointed, prophet, king, and uh, prophet, king, what's the other one? And priest, that the Bible has <clears throat> prohibitions against drinking wine for all three of them. Anybody who's anointed, just it's off the table. It's off the table. If you're going to be filled with the Spirit of God, you're not going to be filled with the spirits of wine because God's Holy Spirit wants to do something in you, and wine would inhibit the abilities of the Holy Spirit to do marvelous things through us. Fascinating here. So even <clears throat> the greatest prophet of all times, Jesus says, no wine, no wine. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's belly. Wow. So here we got Jesus' conception is going to be accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's belly. If John the Baptist was not filled with the Holy Spirit, there's no way he could have gone on <clears throat> to be successful in his mission to turn the whole thoughts of the nation to receiving the Messiah when he would come for his mission. John's mission was going to be only six months in duration before he'd be arrested by Herod and put in the prison for two years before he'd be beheaded. Only six months of a ministry. How about that? But he was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and because the Holy Spirit be with him, he would be successful in his mission in turning the hearts of the people back to God and to make a people ready and prepared to meet the Lord. So how does Mary respond? <clears throat> now that she's being told Elizabeth's pregnant, six months along, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. And this thing that we brought born into you is going to be the Christ child. Verse 38, Mary's response. Listen to this. I'm telling you, I want a heart like Mary's. Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You know, what a winning attitude. Whatever you want to do in me, Lord, whatever you want to do through me, I give you my consent. Go ahead. Do it. What a great attitude. I, you know, sometimes when we study the Bible and we come on some teaching and stuff like, okay, God's asking us to do this, um, whatever it is, you know, maybe it's laying aside a certain kind of meat we used to eat before or a certain kind of beverage we used to drink before or laying aside some money for tithe or keeping a day different than we used to on Sabbath day. Uh, I can't work on it. Well, stuff like that, you know, it's like uh, we wrestle with that. How are we going to do that? How are we going to provide it? Mary's thing is... Uh, be it to me according to your will, Lord. I, I'm, I'm in. I don't know how it's going to work. You told me how. I believe it. Let's do it. 
You know, I love that attitude. Man, I want to have an attitude like that. Don't count the cost before you say yes. Say, no, Lord, if you're asking for me to do this, I say yes, and you take care of how we're going to pay the cost to have this happen, right? That's called faith. <laughs> That's, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Mary had faith. Yes, Lord, be it to me according to your will. I love Mary's attitude. But there's something to take away from here as well. Mary had to be willing. She had to give her consent in order for God to be able to work his miracle of incarnation with her. She had to give her consent. <clears throat> Gabriel came down to tell her, Lord, you are blessed among women. God has handpicked you to be the mother of the Messiah. And uh, basically, would she consent? And when she said, be it to me according to your will, Gabriel's gone. Gabriel's gone. And for those who are in heaven, they're watching. You know, I just, the angel's listening in. What's Mary going to say? What's she going to say? No, Lord, that's, that's too much. You know, people are going to say, hey, uh, you know what? Uh, yeah, sure, right, you're chi- with child from the Holy Spirit. You're probably having premarital sex, and that's really the cover story behind all that, right? You know, and she had to live that down through her whole life, all the way down to when Jesus was arrested and stuff. They threw that back at her, you know, well, we don't know where this guy comes from. You know, that's really what they're saying. A li- illegitimate birth in their view. How could he be the Messiah? She had to live that down her whole life. But Mary did. She was willing to do that. So I think about her consent. And as soon as that was done, Gabriel's gone. They go to heaven. Why? Because Jesus is within minutes of disappearing, taken off the crown, taken off the royal robes, putting aside. And then he's gone from sight. He's vanished. Where is he? He's reduced down to a single cell and implanted in Mary's womb. Just like that. Just like that. Just like there he was. He's gone. We're not going to really see him for nine months till he comes out born like a human being. Now he's going to carry flesh the rest of his existence in eternity. He's not going to be the same as what he went when he went in. That's going to be different. He's going to carry humanity back to heaven when he goes back there. We have a representative at the right hand of God because of Jesus wearing our human, humanity, humanness, so humanity. And I praise God for that. So much to praise God for so this whole thing about consent. So the big thing for you and I is when we run into these things in Scripture where God's asking to do something is to say, yes, Lord. I vote yes. I will do, by God's grace, I want to submit to you. I want you to do your will me in me and through me. I want to be used by me. Go for it. I give my consent. Whatever it is, let's do it. That's what God's really looking for. <clears throat> so then we go to, Mar- to uh, Sarah. Remember when Sarah, she was barren. She was 90 years old. 89, when the angel came and told Abraham that next year at this time, Sarah's going to have a baby, way postmenopausal, way postmenopausal, impossible with man. The existence of the Hebrew people was a divine act, supernatural act of a postmenopausal woman being able to have a son that would be called Isaac. Isaac, his wife Rebecca was barren. <clears throat> she couldn't have children. The Hebrew nation through which the Messiah would be coming through they're, Satan's trying to stop it, right? He's trying to stop it. If they can have children, it's going to come to Abraham. If I can stop Abraham from having children with Sarah, no Messiah coming. If I can stop Abraham from Isaac having children through Rebecca, no Messiah. You can see how Satan's working. He's just trying to stop everything he can to keep Jesus from being born. But once again, a supernatural act of God, and Rebecca has twins <clears throat> through which <clears throat> the Messiah would come. So <clears throat> the whole Hebrew nation... <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the whole Hebrew nation would be non-existent had it not been for God allowing supernaturally the birth of Isaac and uh, the birth of <clears throat> Jacob. You know, it's kind of interesting that <clears throat> both Abraham and Isaac prayed for their wives. Did you know that? They prayed and uh, it was in response to those prayers that God answered their prayer and brought forth children. So back to Luke chapter 1, verse 39. Now, Mary arose in those days, and she went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah. Verse 40, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. Right? She's going to go check out the story. <laughs> grandma Elizabeth is going to have a baby. It's not her grandma. It's a distant relative, but grandma age-wise. 
And she entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth, verse 41. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. I tell you, when anybody's filled with the Holy Spirit, they're going to say something and it's going to bless everybody in the house pretty much. There's going to be some, some great words coming out. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 42, and then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women, talking to Mary, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? How did she know that? How did she know that? Nobody talked to her about that. How did she know? You know, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, God can communicate with, with you things that you wouldn't otherwise know. She was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit told her that Mary is pregnant. You know, Mary, if she went right away, she would not be showing, by the way. It takes three months or so for things to start to show up. She would not have a clue by looking at her that she was pregnant. So the Holy Spirit indicated that Mary's pregnant and she is carrying the Messiah. And she's like, oh. and so she says these words. Why is this granted to me? The pleasure, you know, the privilege, the honor that the mother of my Lord should come to me. What a deal that is, right? What if you'd been living in that time and Mary comes to visit you and you know that she's carrying the Messiah? Wouldn't you feel like honored? I would be super honored. Verse 44, for indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. What does that mean? What does that mean? Did John the Baptist know that his Lord was near and that is why he leaped for joy in the womb? I don't know. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist is, right? He's already filled with the Holy Spirit. And here comes Mary. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit. And his mother is filled with the Holy Spirit. We got a lot of Holy Spirit working here. And John leaps for joy in the belly of his mother. And Elizabeth's interpretation is that somehow John the Baptist knew this little in utero child. I don't know. I don't even know if he had enough cognition to know or if it's just a divine thing that God said kick, kick, you know? I don't know, but I know this much, that somehow the Holy Spirit was indicating that Jesus the Messiah was there, and everybody who was filled with the Holy Spirit responded in some way, shape, or form. Whether it was Elizabeth praising God and blessing Mary, or John the Baptist kicking in his mother's womb, whatever it is, when the Holy Spirit's in town, big things happen. So did Elizabeth's husband, Zachariah, believe Gabriel's announcement that his wife was going to have a son? Oh, wait, let's go back to verse 45. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. So there's Mary. She's wondering what the angel said. She doesn't totally understand how this is going to work. And Elizabeth gives the confirmation. Everything that was told to you from the Lord is going to happen. You know, that's, that, isn't that encouraging? Everything that was told to you is going to happen, Mary. Okay, Lord, okay, I accept that, right? But think about what Elizabeth's position is. She's given a blessing to Mary because Mary believed. What about her own husband? Remember when he was in the temple serving and uh, angel Gabriel says, hey, by the way, your wife, your prayers have been answered. So obviously Zachariah is praying for his wife to have a child, even postpartum, postmenopausal. Uh, He's praying. And you know, you think that a man of the cloth a priest, a pastor, whatever, when they hear those words, say, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, for answering my prayers, right? But what? He doubted. He doubted. Wait, wait, a lay person like Mary, uneducated by worldly standards, believes God and gets the blessing, but here's this guy who's been trained as a Levite, he understands the scriptures and all these things, and he doubts, and he misses the blessing. He misses the blessing. He's going to be mute for the whole nine months that his wife is pregnant, and it's only after she gives birth that his mouth's going to be open. He's going to be able to say anything about it. So God says, you didn't believe? I'm going to shut your mouth because you don't have nothing to say if you're not a believer. You just don't. Nothing that's going to bless anybody. Nothing's going to be uplifting anybody. If you're not a believer, you have nothing to say that's going to be useful by God to win people to, Right? So it's kind of fascinating that Elizabeth in her own house, her own husband, a priest, didn't believe. What about you? Do you believe God's promises? 
The blessings of God are yours if you do, just like Mary's. So another question, does being spirit-filled matter in receiving a blessing um, and being a blessing? It really does. There's another place in Jesus' birth story that fleshes that out. Let's go to Luke chapter 2, verse 21. We see that this is the time when Jesus would be circumcised and is going to be presented to the temple. Luke 2, 21, it says, When eight days were completed for the circumcision of Christ, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Verse 22. Now, when the days of purification according to the law of Moses <clears throat> were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. All right? So here they are, they're going to present him, they're going to give him to the priest, the priest is going to bless him, he's going to write his name in the scroll, they're going to do a sacrifice for sin on their behalf, um, and that's the blessing. That's the blessing that's going to take place. But you know, it's fascinating that Luke doesn't waste any ink on the, pre, the, presiding, um, the presiding priest of the day that was doing the presentations, because he didn't believe himself. He didn't believe, he was not filled with the Holy Spirit. He did not recognize who it was in his hands that it was the one who created the worlds. It was the Messiah who was coming. He was clueless to the fact that he held in his hands the king of the universe, completely clueless. A man of the cloth, yes, but not filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to get the point home to you that I don't care if you're a pastor or a priest or whatever you are, it doesn't really matter. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you miss out on vital information. It's so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> So he was clueless. He unceremoniously performed the dedication, went through the routine, the ritual. But the Holy Spirit doesn't leave himself without witness. He never does. Luke 2.25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. So here we got Simeon's filled with the Holy Spirit. He happens to be moved on by the Holy Spirit to go to the temple at that particular time. By the way, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, God's got your calendar in front of him and he makes some divine appointments and he steers you towards them so that those things can happen. When you put God as Lord of your life, he takes control and he guides you into where you need to be at the right time to be a witness to somebody, to encourage somebody, to lift somebody up, to minister to somebody. It doesn't matter. God has you for a purpose where you are. So here is Simeon. Verse 26, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So the Holy Spirit already revealed to Simeon things in advance. So he came by the Spirit in the temple. There is a Spirit compelled him to go, you know, by the Spirit. He came to the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do to him according to the custom of the law, right? So once again, the divine timing is there. And there is Simeon, verse 28. Simeon, what does he do? He takes Jesus up in his arms. He blesses God and says, Lord, now let, you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things that were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed him, blessed the child. Bless them, Mary and Joseph as well, and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, the sword shall also pierce your own soul also, is talking to Mary, that the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. So Simeon is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's led by the Holy Spirit to be in the temple at that exact moment. He's told by the Holy Spirit that this baby is the Christ child. The Holy Spirit speaks through Simeon, and he prophesies regarding the responses to Jesus' ministry, the rising and the fall of many people in Israel because of Jesus being there. He reveals to Mary that her heart would be pierced by the sword. Some of the things that are going to happen to Jesus is going to break her heart. He foretells these things. So the question is, are you spirit-filled? Am I spirit-filled? If not, why not? To be spirit-filled, it is said that Simeon was a just and a devout man, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was with him. You know, are we just and devout in the way we live our lives before the Lord and before the community? Because that's kind of like a prerequisite. If we're living the truth and the Holy Spirit is in us, that allows the Holy Spirit to do amazing things through us. As we study God's words, it allows the Holy Spirit to teach us all things 
and to grow us in the fullness of the stature of Christ. It allows the Holy Spirit to take our calendar and make those divine appointments. It was the Holy Spirit that made a difference between the priest Simeon coming in and recognizing Jesus as the Messiah and the lack of the Holy Spirit on the presenting Levite of the day. So the Holy Spirit works in our life. I could share. I was going to share some stuff, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to close with this. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 talks about how we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and we can be born again. Born of water, born of the Spirit, born from above. But Luke eleven thirteen, 13, it's a gift that we must ask for. It's not something that we receive. It's something we must ask for. And by faith, we receive it. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit can do things in our life and we can be a witness to him everywhere we go. So the mystery factor of Christmas is the Holy Spirit. And while we're worshiping Jesus, I want to encourage you to invite Jesus into your heart with, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, that you can be filled with him, Spirit, and you can be a witness for him and the miracles that he wants to do. Our closing song is Holy Spirit, Light Divine, 268. Father God, we've been blessed as we've contemplated scripture and recognized the magnitude of the sacrifice you've made on our behalf. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit, Lord, and we ask that you would come into our hearts today. We ask that you put your spirit upon us, that we might be made in your image and likeness, and that we might reflect your glory, the glory of your character of love, caring and serving others, lifting up Jesus to them, that their lives can be full too. So Lord, bless us through this Christmas season, and thank you for the gifts that you give in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh,